Um, so we have the whole concept of DNA replication um, basically relies on the fact that we have two strands, right? They're complementary to one another, just to, to review for you guys that didn't read it. Um, we have two strands that are complementary to one another. Remember, A is going to bind with T and G is going to bind with C. Those are our complementary bases. So that if you have a strand of DNA, and I know we have mentioned this previously, but just to that has A, T, T, G as like whatever, that top strand would be G. Um, then this would be T, A, A, C. The other aspects, so this is one side of the strand and the other side of the strand. These are linked together by hydrogen bonds, right? Pretty weak association. And the whole strand, that means the whole entire strand is held together by hydrogen bonds, weak bonds. And um, that's pretty interesting when you think about that that way, that your two strands and your DNA and your cells right now are being held together by hydrogen bonds. Um, but that's how it works. And so we have one strand basically on top and another strand on the bottom. Um, and based on the backbone structure, which remember is going to be a whole bunch of phosphates and sugars, and they're going to be linked up with these bases, right? I'm just not drawing it the way that it really is. Um, these phosphates and sugars, like here would be a nucleotide, right? A phosphate, sugar, and a base. So these are these are going to make the backbone, the phosphates and sugar units. And these are the bases that are making up like what the message means on the inside of the DNA. These phosphate sugar backbone is oriented in a specific way, just based on the chemistry, how this is set up. So they're they numbered because the, who wouldn't want to number every carbon in a fucking atom? I don't know, but they decided that's what they need to do. So five prime carbon, that's they've numbered the carbons in the sugar. And the five prime carbon is the free one on that end, and the three prime carbon is the free one on this end. Okay, that's why it is five times three prime. Whenever I get to saying that, so that you know what that means. So the other strand is not the same, but it's the opposite. So you can think of it as being opposite in a lot of ways. Opposite with the opposite base on the other side. Opposite with their backbone is going just the opposite direction, chemically structural, right? It's still the same nucleotide, but the backbone will be running in the opposite direction. That is called, an, that's anti-parallel. That's what that is called. So this arrangement, 5.3 prime, and then 5.3 prime the other way, they're parallel, but they're going in opposite directions, so anti-parallel, okay? So that's one thing. And then the other thing, of course, you have the complementary bases linked together by the hydrogen bonds. Um, the other thing is that whenever we are making a copy of this DNA, we have to split it apart. Of course, that makes sense, yeah? And we'll use one strand as a template to make another strand of this. And then the old strand of this, we use to make a new strand of that, right? So one is an old, making a new from it. The other is the other old, making a new from that. So our new products are what we would call semi-conservative. Where if we are making a copy of one double-stranded helix to make two double-stranded helix, because we're going to make a new cell or whatever it is that we're doing, which your cells do all the time, right? Um, if that is happening, then um, the new ones, the two daughter strands, will consist of one old and one new, both of them, one old and one new, one old and one new. Which is one would have been the top and one would have been the bottom, right? So um, that's how semi-conservative, like what that means. I'm reprising all of this just because when we get into talking about the DNA stuff in this chapter, this will help understanding this. Okay? So that's the general concept of how DNA is going to operate, whether we're replicating it or whatever. But because we have those hydrogen bonds holding those two strands together, and we know the hydrogen bonds are particularly weak, you can break those bonds fairly easily with something like heat. You can also break them with you know, change in pH, stuff that we've talked about in the chemistry chapter before. But uh, it's a very useful concept, knowing that you can split these strands apart just by heating them. And that if you cool it back down, they will come back together exactly how they were, just because the A's bind with the T's and the G's with the C's and everything like that. So that is a useful concept as far as 
what we're going to get into with biotech stuff. Um, first, we're going to talk about uh, restriction endonucleases. Uh, these are enzymes. So anytime, anytime you guys hear ACE, whether it's ligase or DNA polymerase or whatever it is, ACE, endonuclease, those are enzymes and all enzymes are proteins. Okay. Um, they have a specific shape that allows them to be catalysts for certain kinds of reactions. In this case, this enzyme has a specific shape that lets it be a catalyst for cutting DNA at specific sequences, basically. And so they recognize, originally they existed in uh, bacteria as a protective thing. So it helps them cut up foreign DNA that wasn't supposed to be there. Um, but now we've hijacked that whole concept and put it to use in biotech. So what we do now, we have recognized quite a few of these enzymes that exist in many different kinds of bacteria. And um, they're sequences that they recognize and cut at. And we can use that to our advantage to cut like our target DNA and cut a plasmid or something else uh, dealing with like bacteria vector and then put them together to put our gene in the vector, right? We're going to get into more detail on how that works in a moment, but that that's a base concept of what these are for, okay? They recognize sequences of about four to 10 base pairs long. Um, and it's pretty interesting, the sequences that they do uh, recognize and act on because those sequences are palindromes. They read the same on forward on one strand as they do backward on the other strand. Um, and I'm gonna show you an example of it in a moment, but it's kind of interesting because uh, they're also complements. Like if it's, there, they'll always be in evens. So if it's like six, the first three on that top strand the second three will be complementary to those first three as well. So, and again, I'll show you what I mean, but, um, but yeah, so they cut in a way that we leave sticky ends. And by sticky end, I mean a single strand uh, piece at one end will be left free. So they're not going to cut um, at a blunt, they can cut bluntly, but the useful aspect of them is when they cut at sticky end. So I do want you to remember they can cut bluntly. The useful aspect when they cut at sticky end, and that means like, a sticky end would be like leaving just the A, T, Q, G. So that whenever I cut on my other side with like my plasma or whatever I'm trying to put my gene in, that it'll have this matchup so they'll stick together whenever I'm trying to put the genes together. So that's the idea of putting DNA sequences together and um, making bacteria, you know, produce human proteins and whatever else you might want them to do. I don't know. So uh, yeah. This is the kind of crap that's going to be going on anytime that you have a GMO, any GMO um, of anything. If you have modified anything at all, ever, their genetic material, then it is a GMO. That includes any bacteria that do produce insulin or something like that. Um, if you are a diabetic or you know somebody who is diabetic, I don't care if they're type 1 or type 2, if they use insulin, it comes from a GMO bacteria. It's producing human insulin because it's way more cost effective than killing cows to get their insulin or something like that, right? So, um, but yeah, that's the idea. So sticky ends. So they'll, this is the good picture. This is what I like on this picture. So we have a depiction here, uh, let me get my pen. Basically how we will be cutting our double helix. So there's our double helix, of course. And then we recognize these four base pairs. This one is CTAG, and its opposite strand, of course, would then be GATC. But what does it read? This one is CTAG. If you go on the other side, again, five prime to three prime one way and five prime to three prime the other way, CTAG. Same forward and backwards from one another, just because it's that anti-parallel strand there that's going in the opposite direction. So that's a palindrome. And when I said that they were kind of a match to one another at that halfway point, here, what I'm talking about, that C-T-A-G, if I were to split that down the middle, the A would bind with the T and the G would bind with the C. You could like fold it over, basically, and it would match up with itself. That's another sign that this is going to be a site where a restriction endonuclease will be operating. It's kind of crazy how that 
works. I mean, uh, and there's so many of them that recognize so many of these palindromic type sequences and do similar functions. But yeah, um, these uh, bacteria have developed these enzymes specifically to do this. And it was to cut out maybe uh, foreign DNA. When I say foreign DNA, I mean a plasmid that they got into them from another bacteria that they didn't want has genes that are detrimental to them, or even could be they got infected by a bacteriophage and the genes in that aren't actually helpful for them or they don't want to keep it around so they can cut it up and make it so that it can't do its job. That's what it's really for. So yeah, so you can see we create those sticky ends, um, the overhang with the red and the blue, so they can match up with, again, just their complementary sequence on another bit of DNA that you cut with the same enzyme. So if you cut it with the same enzyme, it'll have the same matchup with it. Okay, this leads us to the concept of restriction fragments and restriction fragment length polymorphisms. <laughs> or RFLPs, which is, is fine. I'm not ever gonna, this is one I don't ever wanna have to trip you up on the, these four words because I can never remember the four words. I know it's RFLP, I know it's restriction and polymorphism, but I never, I can never keep up with the fragment or the length or whatever, unless it's in front of me. So, but uh, yeah, so I won't try to give you like, is it restriction fragment length polymorphism or restriction fragment, I don't know loophole polymorphism. I'm not going to give you those sorts of crappy choices. So not for that one. Um, but know what it is and know what that means. What is it and what does it mean? Well, if I cut my DNA with one restriction enzyme, let's say restriction enzyme one, and I cut your DNA with restriction enzyme one, we already know that your DNA isn't the same as my DNA, right? Can't be. Impossible. Um, so if I cut mine with one enzyme and you cut yours with the same enzyme, it's going to cut them into different fragment lengths comparatively, right? So that's what this is talking about. That's restriction fragment um, length polymorphisms. Yeah, so using those endonucleases, those enzymes, to give uh, patterns of fragments of different lengths. So we can compare DNA of two organisms at a specific site. Wow. So if this doesn't immediately pop up in your mind as something they would use in forensics, it should, right? So this is way easier than sequencing somebody's whole genome or something like that. When I can just like cut your DNA up with some enzymes and see how yours looks compared to everybody else's or compared to the blood that they found at the location where the murder happened um, and then compare it that way, it's a lot easier than doing a whole sequencing and everything else, other crap. Okay, there are other tools we can use, such as ligase and reverse transcriptase. I know we've talked about reverse transcriptase. That is that enzyme that allows us to make DNA out of RNA, right? It went the opposite way of what we typically would go. It came from HIV and other retroviruses, but yeah, it allows that um, virus to use its little RNA genome to make DNA to insert into your DNA. That's what it uses it for. Uh, but we use that now as a tool if we have samples that we know are gonna be RNA, turning them into DNA for whatever the purpose will be. And we'll mention what exactly that could be used for in a moment. But uh, then we have ligase. Ligase is another very important one. It is like the um, hero, the undetected, unappreciated hero underneath all of it all. This is the one that is fixing up, like you're, you know, we get these enzymes, the restriction enzymes that come along and cut up things and then rejoin things. Now we're putting genes inside of other, you know, DNA and all this fun, exciting stuff. None of that's going to work if we don't seal it back up. Okay. So if you guys recall, for those of you who did read the chapter, the last chapter about um, Okazaki fragments, because remember, you're going to be sequencing, you're going to be pushing your DNA to be making it in the five prime, three prime direction. So that means we're putting it in the five prime, the three prime direction. So that would be like uh, adding it five prime, three prime. Anyways, so uh, that would be like, if you were reading on this strand, you could push through and just keep adding on five prime, three prime, five prime, three prime, da, 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 going on and going on. But you're pushing in one direction and you don't have the entire genome open and unwound. That's nuts, right? So you're going in what they would call the replication of origin. And that fork where that is opening up will be going in one direction. But because we can't add in five prime to three prime on that other strand in the opposite direction, because we're going in this direction only, 
you might think on this strand, oh yeah, we'll just pop a polymerase on and go in the opposite direction. Well, yeah, that's what we're going to do. So as we open up, we would be going on, pop a polymerase on, go in the opposite direction, but now we're just opening it up more. Now what? You have to pop another polymerase on and make it in that other direction, right? So you end up opening up and make a little bit and opening up and make a little bit on that other strand. That's the lagging strand. If the leading strand just goes straight through the lagging strand, which is oriented the opposite way. And so we have to make it in pieces because of this stupid little five pound blueprint. So um, that's how all of this is going to always operate. DNA always five times through time, anytime, anything is happening. Okay. And so because of that, we make these little fragments that we call Okazaki fragments. And that's just the guy that discovered that. And we have to seal them all up together. So that's like DA number one, most important point where we need DNA ligase. Because if we don't seal those fragments up back together, then it's not an actual, you know, double stranded anymore. It's one strand with a bunch of fragments on it. And so it doesn't work. You need those bonds between the phosphates and the sugar to actually be formed, fully formed phosphodiester bonds. Anyways, you need that. Um, there's a reason why it's structured the way it is. So ligase is important there. Ligase being ACE, being, of course, the enzyme aspect. Um, ligase, like if you're, it's like ligating. Some of you guys might know what that word means, but it literally is just joining things together. Um, so we're ligating together um, the ends of DNA, recreating that phosphodiester bond to seal those parts back together. Um, yeah, so that's important. So we need this pretty much any time that you have any fragment that you put into another fragment. So if we're doing that in our genetic engineering, we need ligase there. And that, if you're doing that with the freaking enzymes that we were talking about over here, those popping this in to this, they're still not joined here until you introduce ligase to join them back together. And then they can be a full strand. Okay. Ligase, important, incredibly important. This is where I'm going to get into talking about a little bit about, anyways, the reverse transcriptase and how it plays into all of this. Um, complementary DNA. It's basically mRNA. Like we make our mRNA and that's what we make our proteins from, right? Before we do that, we have to cut out our introns. That was a whole other thing too in another chapter, but an intron is a part of DNA that code, doesn't code for anything. And I don't know why they're there. I'm sure somebody has some sort of theory on it or whatever, but in eukaryotic genes only, only in eukaryotes, we have introns and we have to splice those out in this structure called a spliceosome that actually cuts out the introns from our mRNA, joins the exons introns and exons. So inside and X being outside, right? So what's left are the exons and we have to join those together um, in this whole spliceosome process, right? It works to do that. And then we have the functioning mRNA within the cells. So see here how we have cut out our introns here, um, spliced out the gray portion of that precursor mRNA. And now the actual functioning mRNA, we've removed that. Okay, so if I put genes like this, like our actual genes with our introns coded in our genes into a bacteria. Bacteria do not have these introns. They don't know what to do with that. So we have to, if we're putting our genetic information into a bacteria to make insulin or something, already give them the sequence from this. So how do we get the sequence from this most easily and turn it into DNA? Reverse transcriptase. Right, because it's already ready to go, and we can just turn that back into DNA. So that's that complementary DNA that this is talking about, a cDNA. So using the pre-spliced um, messenger RNA that's actually functioning in the cell and turning that into DNA, so that the uh, bacteria can like actually read it and do stuff with it. Okay. All right. Next on is CRISPR. This is clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. I'm not ever going to test you on those words. I didn't even know that was a thing. So I know CRISPR though, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard of CRISPR. CRISPR-Cas9 is a system of uh, basically the ability of these bacteria, again, to get rid of foreign DNA. It's a different kind of system than what we were seeing with the uh, endonucleases, but not completely. It still relies on some specific, sometimes even palindromic sequences in order to work, because remember palindromic repeats. When we have these repeats going on, 
in bacteria, they see that and they're like, this is where my enzyme, Cas9, is going to work in the CRISPR um, gene segment or whatever. So uh, that will form, cut out the foreign DNA for the bacteria. That's great for the bacteria. What does it mean for us? And why is it important? And why have you heard about it probably? It's because you can design basically or um, create versions of Cas9 from CRISPR uh, in a way that they will cut out DNA at any location you can think of pretty much. So you can engineer this to cut DNA anywhere you want. Now you might be like, okay, well, can't you just cut it anywhere you want? Absolutely not. Like before we were relying on restriction enzymes and that's all we had to cut DNA. So now we have this whole system that allows us to cut at very specific sequences. That means I can insert a gene anywhere in a genome or something like that. It's not that particularly useful in a growing live human being that's fully, <laughs> that's grown already. It's more useful in a developing uh, organism, um, single-celled organisms like bacteria and stuff like that for now, right? Um, there's a lot of people doing garage uh, science, and I mean that in all literal sincerity, that there are plenty of people out there who in their garages are trying to do genetic, you know, research on themselves or their loved ones to, and their hearts generally are in the right place, you know, trying to cure their child of uh, hereditary disease that doesn't have a cure for it and will not have a cure for it in that child's lifetime. Um, people like that. So it's not all crazy. It is noble, but they don't have a good grasp of the science behind it, unfortunately. So they're just creating hope where there should be none, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, they don't have the resources in order to make that work in an actual living whole person. Because how do you get that to work in all of the cells in your body? Because every cell in your body has the messed up gene if you have a hereditary disorder, right? Every cell in your body does. So how do you fix every cell in your body or every cell in your liver or whatever it is that is affected? Um, how do you get that to work? It doesn't just replicate itself. Your cells have to replicate it. And so that's the problem just injecting DNA into somebody is not useful at all. So, which we'll, we'll get back to that with the uh, GMOs, I promise in a moment, but yeah. So the, the concept though is there that this could eventually lead to technology that could treat things permanently. So that's the interesting aspect of it. It doesn't exist yet. Nobody has done it. If Pfizer can't do it, then Joe Blow and his garage is not gonna do it, come on because they would have already made money off of that, right? We all know. So moving on, polymerase chain reaction. This is PCR. Um, so PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. This is an important one that you might actually get tested on as far as I need you to actually be aware of what the words are for this one. Polymerase chain reaction. It's important that it is a chain reaction. And it does work quite a lot like, I guess, the concept of a Xerox machine. We're just going to be making copies of the DNA that we have. We can replicate um, DNA where we can have like one single bit of DNA and replicate it into billions of copies in just a matter of like a couple hours tops. And you do nothing. All you do is program a machine and it fluctuates temperature and you give it its little buffer with all of what it needs for this to happen and it does all the work for you. And you just like wait. Um, so PCR, so it can be used, we already know, it can be used for diagnosis, right? And uh, the most common version of PCR that we would be using for diagnosis is going to be RT-PCR or real-time PCR. Real-time PCR is what it sounds like. Basically, whenever we are making copies, because you know, when we are, it's, this is just replicating DNA. That's all this is doing. So it's not anything crazier than what we already know. So splitting these strands apart and then adding on complementary nucleotides in the five prime to three prime direction, of course, obeying, you know, nature's rules or whatever. Um, and, and that, and so we get, keep making copy and copy and copy and copy. That's nice. Um, but like when we're doing real-time PCR, basically every time that you're adding a uh, complementary nucleotide back on in your new copies, it releases like a fluorescent flash and the machine can read that. And each A has one color, T has one color, P has one color, and G has one color. So you can literally follow the sequence that is being copied 
in every single round of PCR. Why is that important? Because in PCR, we are targeting one specific gene. And it is so specific that if I am testing for E. coli, but it has salmonella in it, it will nothing will happen at all. Nothing. Because that's the gene that we picked was from E. coli specifically, right? And can you make it more general for all of E. coli versus just O157H7, which is the um, one that causes dysentery? Uh, yeah, they do that actually. And I did that in my work. So if something popped positive for E. coli, we would then test it for S. tech, which is sugar toxin producing E. coli, um, which is O157H7, which is the one they're all concerned about, right, on the news. So um, we wouldn't test that though until we knew there was a cold line. But you know, you get it. So uh, we test for a specific thing. So that's great. So, oh yeah, you can test for the specific thing. So you know exactly what it is that you are you know, copying out. Yes, you can only do one thing at a time though. So what I'm saying is like, if you have a sample and you're like, hmm, I want to know if I swab this person's sinus cavity, I want to do PCR to figure out if it is flu or if it is, we ran out of rapid tests, let's say, and I want to know if it's flu or if it is COVID. You can't just pop it into a PCR. That's not a thing. Um, you would have to run PCR for flu and PCR for COVID separately because they're going to have different genes they're going to be targeting. And they're going to run at different times because they're going to be different lengths. And they're going to have more A versus more T or whatever it is, right? That's the issue. The reason I'm really going into all, all this, all of this, because we're going to get into your diseases later on, you know, the ones you're giving your presentations over, and everybody is going to be inclined to say that their disease is diagnosed by PCR. Can most diseases be diagnosed by PCR? Yes. Do you really think that every hospital that you will work at has every single possible ability to test for all diseases that have ever existed? No, okay? Somebody comes into your hospital and they have Ebola and you wanna test for Ebola, you probably don't have the primers, which we'll talk about here in a moment, to test for the genes in Ebola because you probably don't keep that on hand. So what do you do? You send it to the CDC, right? And the CDC does have those primers and whatever. But what I'm telling you is if you have somebody that you need to diagnose right there within the couple hours that it usually takes for PCR, if you don't have the primers, you cannot do it. And if you work in a rural clinic, some of you might end up working in rural clinics at some point. And I recommend that you rotate through them because it's a completely different experience than working in a large hospital. But they don't always have the resources that they have at hospitals. And yeah, they can mail stuff off to DLO or whatever and have it tested. Or they can run tests like we will be doing in the lab, like biochemical tests or whatever, which might actually be faster for them because waiting on it to get you know, shipped out and then ran and then shipped back and all that sort of stuff isn't as useful for them in a rural clinic. So they'll be running kind of, I wanna say the ghetto tests, but it seems that way because the big hospitals don't do those tests anymore because they can afford to have PCR available for anything, uh, for, for all the, the major stuff anyways, maybe not both. So that's the idea. That's why I want you guys to be aware of this. Um, when you guys are working in a hospital and you're just sitting there like, this person is sick, why don't we just do PCR? First of all, you have to know what you're testing for. What, if they're just sick, what are you going to test them for? I have to know that first. And just you know, okay, well, we want to test them for COVID. And if that comes back positive, do you have a plan B? You know what I mean? Like that sort of stuff, you have to think about that when you're in healthcare. No, I mean, really, there's going to be a time you guys are going to go through school and that's great and everything. And you're going to learn how to be treating and dealing with patients at the level you're supposed to. But there's going to be times eventually in your lives where you're going to have to make those choices. And you need to know what you're doing, right? Know what you have available and don't call up the lab and be like, I need to see what this patient is sick with. Here's the sample. And the lab's going to laugh at you in your face and be like, what do you want me to test them for? because we have to know in the lab what you want it tested for. So we, we have this ability to test for basically one strand of DNA. If there was a just literally one strand and we like swabbed up here, I got murdered because you guys didn't like your test score. You want to know who it is that killed me. And you come up here and uh, find, you swab everything and somehow you know that it pops that there is some DNA there. And PCR to replicate that. So there's more of it so we can sequence it or we can do those restriction enzyme cutting to see what 
you know, who it was. But first, you have to have enough DNA to do that. So that's kind of what PCR is for as well. Um, multiplying things up so that you can actually work with them. And that counts as well if you're trying to put genes into bacteria. If you have a lot of bacteria, you typically want a lot of the genes that you're going to be putting into it. You want kind of equal in ratio. So you need to copy the gene that you just, you know, popped a, your insulin gene into a plasmid. And you make copies of that in PCR. You can do that. All right, so that's the idea. So the steps, we're gonna open up the helix. We're gonna expose the strands as templates, just like we do with replication. And then we're gonna add primers. Anytime that we are building new DNA ever in the cell or in PCR, anytime that we're making a new strand of DNA, you have to build off of a primer. In the cell, when we're replicating DNA and making those long new strands for the new cells that you're going to grow to, you know, heal up the cut that you got or whatever, um, when that happens, we used RNA primers, and then we go back in and remove them and replace them with DNA later. We don't talk about that a whole lot, but that is one of the steps, and that is in the uh, book as well. But we have to have primers to build off of. Same thing with PCR. It's not magic, and it needs to know where to start. Because usually what I'm doing is putting a whole genome of E. coli in there. And I want to know if it's E. coli. I don't want to waste my time replicating the entire E. coli genome. That will take a long time to make that, right? When you can just do one gene that is like 500 base pairs long. Whereas the whole genome would be like a million or something. I don't know. It's a lot more. So you're waiting. The time is based on basically adding on those nucleotides. So... Uh, you can do just a gene that is indicative of E. coli or salmonella or whatever it is. Um, and then we have DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase uh, is just the same kind that we would be having in our normal uh, replication, except it's not from humans. It's not from eukaryotes even. It's a DNA polymerase that comes from bacteria. And that's important because I already told you, we're gonna be separating these strands. Remember how we talked about how you can separate those strands or hydrogen bonds using heat? Well, that's how PCR works. That polymerase chain reaction is gonna heat up the DNA to split the strands apart, to force them apart. And so if we're heating up the DNA and that's denaturing, right? That's what that is when it's, we're uh, no longer forming the structure that was functional. So that can also denature proteins because a lot of protein structure depends on hydrogen bonds, right? So that's important as well. So if we heat up, we could be potentially destroying the structure of the DNA polymerase and that could be destroying its function as well. So um, that's the concept there. So we use these polymerases, one or the other, that came from like the thermal vents in the bottom of the sea because their polymerase has to be able to withstand heat and even higher temperatures than what we're exposing them to in PCR. So thermophilic bacteria. We usually call it TAC polymerase because thermos aquaticus is one of them. All right, this is how PCR works. Again, really not that complicated of a concept here. We're going to split the DNA apart. And there's like more going on here than I feel like needs to be. But here's our double strand that we start with. We're going to use heat to split it apart here. Then we're going to add our primers. That's the little yellow guys here. We have to cool it down a little bit to get that to happen. So the heat will be very hot when we split everything apart. We'll have the primers in there, uh, cool it down so that we can favor the primers binding. And there's a, like all sorts of formulas that they'll use. These usually are about 30 base pairs, the primers, um, so that they can be as specific as possible so that we know we're targeting E. coli and not just general gene, right? Um, and then extending, and that just means letting the polymerase do its thing at its optimal temperature, which happens to be 72 degrees Celsius, which is quite hot, actually. Um, but, yeah. And then we'll just repeat it. We made a copy. So now we've got these copies that we made from extending everything, and we'll just split them apart and make a new copy, and then so on and so forth. That's all it is, over and over and over and over again. We can do about 36 cycles, it says down here. Cycle 36, which is a very common number of cycles that you might go through if you were doing PCR, um, you can get more than 68 billion molecules. That is nuts. And that'll be like a couple of hours. 
And again, like just go to lunch and you come back and you've got your billions of copies <laughs> waiting for you. So that's pretty much how it goes. Um, PCR also very reliable. These machines are made for this, even like designed to like reduce, you know, loss of moisture and everything. Typically what all you need to do is add your sample into it, your sample and your primers, which you usually design yourself. And then um, you have all the nucleotides in a buffer. You have to buffer that it just is a buffer. We know about buffers, right? Maintaining everything. Um, you'll have magnesium that helps the polymerase. It'll have the polymerase itself. Everything is there to make this happen. Um, everything that you could possibly need to make copies. All you need to add are your specific primers and your uh, sample. Or if you work at a place like I did in my last place, they sell you these trays that you can just have like 96 wells or whatever. And they already have the primers in there too. You just have to add in the bacteria sample and then pop it in there and run it. So it's pretty easy. All right, so anytime we are dealing with recombinant DNA technology, putting one gene into another organism's genes or whatever it is, that's cloning. That's what that word means, okay? It does not always mean that we are making an exact copy of an organism and regrowing a sheep from a clone or something like that. Is that an example of cloning? Yes, because we are trying to make uh, you know, something to grow that isn't naturally gonna be happening on its own. But, um, but yeah, so the whole idea here is some sort of change was done to the genetics of the organism. Now they are cloned. They're a clone. Uh, usually we have a gene inserted into a vector by a vector. I'm usually talking about the genome of a virus. So that could be a phage or something like that even, or it could be like adenovirus or in the case of our um, stuff, we often use adenovirus um, or a plasmid. And obviously plasmids are gonna be going into bacteria, um, not into our cells, but the plasmid could have all sorts of genes associated with it that can help us select for the presence of our gene that we're interested in. So you made all these copies of your gene, you put them into a plasmid, and now you need to get them into a bacteria. There's all these steps that you need to do um, in order to get your product or whatever it is that you're making. Yes, and then we have the cloning host. So the vector is a different thing than the cloning host. I do wanna be clear about that. The vector is whatever you're putting your gene into directly, genetically speaking. The cloning host is the organism that's gonna be hosting that. Usually, like I said, bacteria are yeast. All right, uh, we already know about plasmids. They're circle, circular. Typically in bacteria, they're going to contain genes that can be helpful to the bacteria, but are not necessary for it to live. Circular DNA is what those are. So they can have antibiotic resistance coded into them. Um, and that's useful for us. And why would that be? Because if you have your plasmid that you put your gene into, let's say it's green fluorescent protein, right? Jellyfish makes them glow. Let's say it's gonna make whatever has the plasma in it glow, bacteria in this case. And let's say uh, you made your plasma, you shoved that glowing gene into it. Your plasma also has a gene for uh, ampicillin resistance. So your bacteria is resistant now to ampicillin. Why is that important? Because you can plate your bacteria out on a bacteria plate that has ampicillin in it and it will not grow unless it actually took up your plasmid inside of it, right? So it's not going to be able to live on that media without that ampicillin resistance. So now you have bacteria that you know have your plasmid that you've designed without having to go crazy and sequence the whole thing and all this stuff that's gonna waste resources and time. So we'll just do it that way. And that's useful. Um, and we will be talking about that in the transformation lab when we get to that one in the lab. Um, then we have bacteriophages, which obviously can insert their DNA into the bacterial host DNA via transduction. Remember how we were talking about um, uh, the uh, lysogenic conversions. So it's sort of like that, but we're hijacking it for our purposes. So this is a plasmid. This is an example of how we would map a plasmid and what genes are on it. We have our ampicillin resistance here. And then in this area here, we have a multiple cloning site. And um, usually it's gonna have some sort of trigger like you're exposed to lactose and then you're gonna produce the gene that you're interested in, but it doesn't always have to work that way. These are all restriction enzymes here. Those are all restriction enzymes. 
And so you have a whole, in this multiple cloning site, a whole slew that you could potentially work with. Um, so if you designed yours to be cut with pine three, then it makes sense, right? So you then you're, uh, you could cut your plasma with that to insert your gene in there, use ligase to seal it all up and so on and so forth. Put it into the bacteria cloning host of your choice, usually E. coli. So now you can have um, basically uh, grow it up, but are we gonna use E. coli? Are we gonna use yeast? Like what are we gonna use? You wanna be sure that whatever it is, we have rapid turnover, high fast growth rate. So we have as much uh, that we can produce as possible. We want large um, quantities. We don't have to use crazy culturing methods. We don't want anything like that. It just gets expensive if we need something special. Um, we don't want to be pathogenic, obviously. And uh, we want to know the whole genome so that we know there's not some gene that's going to interfere with the production of our target um, and all this other stuff. Yeah, we want to have a high yield of protein, whatever we're targeting. So this is an example of uh, one of the things that we make via recombinant DNA technology, um, the drug alpha-2A interferon. So you guys remember interferon. Interferon interferes with the whole sequence of the virus being able to infect the next cell over, right? So our body sees an, an, as something going wrong, an invader or whatever it is that's inside the cell and sends that interferon signal to the guy next to you. So that was in the case of viruses, but it can also do that in the case of cancer because the body can recognize that as something going wrong as well. And so you can use this drug to start signaling the body that basically you've got cancer cells and you need to start fighting it and you need to do a better job of it. Um, and you combine that with other drugs as well, typically in order to uh, help fight things like hairy cell leukemia and Kaposi's sarcoma. Yeah, and we make it in bacteria. They take the introns out um, in order to do that. Remember that cDNA that we made, but yeah. What do you need for cloning? You need your genetic donor. What do I mean by that? If you have a faulty gene for insulin, I don't know, your gene is messed up for it, and I have a good one, then I would be the genetic donor. You can take my good gene out, right, and use that. Isolate that good gene and put it into a plasma, shove it into um, whatever vector that you're looking at. Now, um, this is just showing how we would, again, the sticky ends and everything like that, that we'd be splicing and ligating and sealing everything up to make our new recombinant plasma and put it into a bacteria here. This is just a nice picture of all the stuff that we've been talking about this whole time. Cutting with your restriction enzymes, uh, putting your genes in that you engineered usually to have the ability to use these sticky ends here. And putting it into bacteria. Um, anytime you're putting a uh, plasmid into a bacteria that can just take it up from its environment, that's called transformation. And that bacteria has to be what we would call competent, competent cell, the ability to do that. Um, anyways, so then it has the donor gene in there. We're going to make the mRNA and translate it. So we'll go through transcription and translation um, and then make our protein product as a result. And then we can filter that out from everything else to either get insulin or whatever it is that you're trying to make. Um, yeah. You can also make organisms from scratch. And if you think that that sounds like, I don't know, nuts, nobody's ever actually done that. It has been done. In 2010, scientists, I say scientists, it was like a specific lab group, made a completely new bacteria using just, you know, ATCG and built it from scratch. Just made a new genome. It's not E. coli. It's not anything we've ever seen before. It's just this brand new bacteria. And it grows and it replicates and it is a bacteria. Um, I don't know how to feel about that. That seems like, right? We've seen movies about this, I feel like. Uh, and they're never going to end well. I feel like there's a lesson in there somewhere. Anyway, so you can do that. That's synthetic biology, creating new organisms or even new biological molecules completely from scratch using your knowledge of chemistry and biology, of course, but yeah, that's terrifying to me. So we think that that could be a good way, though, if you're looking at molecules and designing the molecules to be made by something, that that could actually be a way to uh, design new ways to target cancer or other diseases, sure. Making a whole new organism, mm, I don't know, I don't know about it. 
anyways, um, genome analysis, uh, looking at, I don't know, sequencing somebody's genome, or even trying to just determine, you know, similarities between genomes. Uh, one of the useful tools for this, and like we were talking about with our forensics of who, who killed the professor up here, um, one of the useful tools is gel electrophoresis. Um, electro, yeah, electricity. And there is a gel involved. It is made out of something called agarose. It is a sugar from agar, but it's not agar. Okay. And um, basically, you just run your DNA sample, whatever it is. You got your little sample up here, a little bit. It's not enough really for you to do anything with, so you run it through PCR, right? Then you take that sample and you maybe cut it with a specific restriction enzyme and cut everybody else's sample that you got from everybody in the class. Do the same exact thing with their blood samples. And then we're gonna pop them into the wells on these gels and shoot some electricity through it. What happens is the negative charge of the DNA of the phosphate groups there are going to push it towards the positive electrode. Um, and that makes sense. So negative is gonna move towards the positive. And as it does that, the larger molecules are gonna get stuck in the gel. Um, and the smaller ones can kind of snake through a little bit more easily. So the small ones run a lot faster than the large ones do. And that's what causes those bands to form, right? The well itself is just shaped like a rectangle. That's why it gets those lines. But then they're gonna move out and spread out based on the size of the DNA. So large ones get stuck at the top and the small ones go faster. So we've cut up all of our little fragments with our enzymes and now we can run them out on a gel. If we are looking at DNA from different individuals, supposedly, I mean, you can see that individual three and four, clearly the same person in this. So this is what I'm talking about. You, If you cut them all with one enzyme, let's say hind three that we mentioned earlier, and then you develop these little lines across here, you can compare and see which ones are the same um, and it shouldn't be similar from person to person. Now, if you did come up with this and you were like, hmm, well, people could have a similar, you know, uh, fingerprint, DNA fingerprint uh, from cutting just with that one enzyme, you can try another enzyme. The likelihood of it also being the same is like getting really slim at that point, or you could just sequence the whole thing at that point. So now you have the person whose DNA you want to sequence and not sequence everybody's in the whole room. So yeah, so this gives you at least an uh, idea of, you know, a whodunit or somewhere to start with. Another thing we can do is use nucleic acid hybridization. This is gonna be uh, using little pieces of DNA that target a gene, and then uh, samples that are like spread out either on a plate like a bacteria or a filter uh, sample or something like that. And then trying to get the DNA little pieces to bind and match with something on the plate, right? And if it matches, then it means that thing had the matching DNA that we're interested in. So that's what nucleic acid hybridization is about. You can do it with single-stranded RNA, um, sorry, single-stranded DNA, um, and you can probe it with single-stranded DNA or RNA. And RNA, you'll probe with RNA. But anyways, there'll be short stretches of DNA, um, usually with fluorescent dyes, so you can actually see if it did bind in a microscopic setting, or usually a machine is gonna be reading the results. These are usually done in real life situations in the form of a uh, microarray analysis, which we'll get into at the end, but uh, not get into, but introduce the concept. Of it. Anyways, uh, you can diagnose certain things this way. See if this person is carrying the gene that you're interested in. Um, and so this is just looking at bacteria plate. So looking for bacteria that have the gene that you're interested in. If we can do this. Um, uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization would be matching this up in actual real cells. And you can look at the cells like while they would be living in um, the tissue and everything and see which ones have the gene that you're interested in. This is, of course, going to be helpful if we're looking for a cancer gene uh, and looking for tumor cells or something like that. Right. So that, that's fish fluorescent um, in the eye in situ. Yeah. Um, all right, so I keep talking about one, the DNA maybe uh, in the gel, the bigger ones getting trapped and the smaller ones moving faster. 
but how do we quantify the size? We measure them by their base pairs, which is effectively their nucleotides, okay? Um, so BP. So when we talk about those palindromic sequences, the enzymes recognized four to 10 BP base pairs, just four to 10 nucleotides. Uh, and then it's just comparing the size of things. So a lot of times we might refer to something as something B base pairs and then uh, size up to kilobase pairs. So that would be K BP um, and then megabases for millions. So if I do give you a question on the test that says, uh, has all these, like which, which DNA piece is bigger? And I give you a bunch of choices between 100 BP and 100 K BP and whatever that you guys should be able to pick out which one would be the larger one for that. That's uh, definitely gonna be on at least the, the lab exam for sure. Um, okay, so this is just coming back to that DNA profiling, right? Cutting up someone's DNA, it's gonna give different size fragments and we can use that to identify. And then create fingerprints that are going to coincide with individuals, right? We already know. So this is uh, back to that example. So here we have a victim. This is the victim's DNA sample. So if we found some sample on there, we could at least say, oh, this blood over here was the victim's blood or whatever. At the location, we found two evidence samples, maybe a hair or maybe another droplet of blood, right? And then we have two people that we thought were involved. Maybe there were two people that people suspected were in the room trying to kill the professor after the thing. And so uh, you can compare um, the results and see which one you think was likely to have done it. And even though like here you have this band here and it's like harder to see that band, it's there and the machine, a machine analyzing it would be able to see it better than like you and I could. Um, but that's just how much DNA was added into that well. That's all the only reason why it's lighter. But you can see that it is clearly a suspect one that committed the crime. Okay, we can make create sequence maps and I am just like completely uninterested in sequencing genomes, I'm sorry. Um, I just, cool, humans have approximately 80% of their DNA codes with mice, 60% with rice, 30% with C. elegans, which is a worm, it's a round worm. It's a non-pathogenic round worm, but we use that a lot for um, genetic studies. So we can use it as a model for a lot of the DNA for humans. But anyways, um, yeah, we can sequence genomes. And then now you know what the genes are supposed to look like um, so that you can get a sense of when it goes wrong and what it means when it goes wrong. So they have all sorts of ways to do overlapping se sequencing um, in pieces and then combining them. Um, they have machines that do this like automatically now, which is nice, good for them. Genomics and bioinformatics, uh, these are just studying and analyzing genes. Bioinformatics is kind of uh, gleaning the information from the genes and even using it for molecular benefit. So, all right, next we have single nucleotide polymorphisms. Remember, oh, maybe you guys don't remember because maybe you didn't read the last chapter, but in the last chapter, we talked about mutations. There were things like missense mutations or nonsense mutations and stuff like that. So if I had... I don't know, a nucleotide sequence that was like my codons, right, in my RNA. Maybe originally it was A, G, A. Now, I mean, I don't know what it codes for, but let's just say it's proline, okay? That codes for proline, that's the normal amino acid associated with it. But let's say there was a mutation, just one single mutation, and now we have U, G. So we'll change this here, right? Just that one nucleotide. This isn't gonna code for a different amino acid. This is gonna code for stop. So that means wherever you are in making your protein, if you had that mutation and just one nucleotide, that that could stop production of that protein, right? Um, some proteins, when that happens, Maybe that's a normal thing. Maybe that's what makes my hair brown as opposed to blonde or something. That can be stuff like that. Mutations like that can lead to differences that might not necessarily be harmful or could even be beneficial. Sometimes though, I'm sure you can imagine if you're stopping too early on some proteins, that could kill you because you don't have that protein anymore or at least be detrimental to your health, right? 
So those are single nucleotide po polymorphisms. Um, if I had it changed like that and my hair is brown now instead of blonde, then, you know, no big deal, but it's still a single nucleotide polymorphism. Poly just being many, right? Different kinds of effects of it. But sometimes there are some genes associated with that that can be a greater risk for health, the ones that would be harmed by the early stop or something like that. So in this particular case, we have arginine, arginine, glycine. These are our amino acids that are produced from uh, the DNA GCT and our codon CGA. Um, here, instead of GCT, we have GTT and CAA instead of CGA. So now we have made glutamine instead of arginine. And so now instead of arginine, yeah, you get it. So we made the wrong thing here. This now is no longer a functioning protein the way that it should. And what happens is, a normal person has that uh, original code. You have normal clotting situation. You, uh, you know, can fall and uh, create a scab or whatever, but you're not excessively clotting inside of your body, as opposed to somebody that has this disease that I mentioned in the previous slide, a thrombophilia with factor five problems that leads to excessive clotting, putting you at severe risk for stroke. That could be deadly, right? So that is an issue there. But that's one amino, that's one nucleotide, a single nucleotide polymorphism, just one nucleotide, and that person's now at huge risk for stroke. All right, uh, this is the DNA microarray that I was talking about. Uh, there's all these sorts of different kinds of genes on here. Um, and then you can put like a patient sample over it and see which uh, type of gene mutation they might have if it binds up with that matching DNA, right? So matching up DNA sequences to see. Uh, you know, all sorts of stuff. We can identify subtypes of cancer um, and allow us to treat uh, drug, treat patients with specific drugs based on that subtype, for example. All right, how do we use recombinant DNA, recombinant organisms, uh, sources of protein, uh, nucleotide sequences? Man, if you guys think for one minute that you, that, that wonderful uh, impossible meat isn't a GMO, I got I got news for you. Just saying, that's genetically engineered. So that's a GMO. Anytime that there's anything with the gene being changed at all is a GMO, okay? Uh, yeah, so we can have large scale manufacturing of things that people maybe need for uh, improving their health. We talked about interferons, interleukins, and tumor necrosis factor can also be used to treat cancer as well. These are immune system factors, trying to get the immune system to fight against the cancer. You may have Remicade and Humira, which are kind of like the opposite in a way. Both of these guys are going to be um, used to block the uh, body's response to infl inflammation, basically. Um, but yeah, so that we use these to treat all sorts of inflammatory problems like rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's. Uh, we can also use uh, bacteria and other, maybe even yeast, to make things like erythropoietin, which we use to uh, help you, if you have uh, anemia problems, make more red blood cells or human growth hormone for people who might have dwarfism or wasting syndrome. All right, genetically modified organisms, also known as transgenic organisms, the same exact thing, okay? Um, any organism produced through introduction of any foreign gene whatsoever. Um, we have made uh, GMO microbes, plants, and animals. This shouldn't be any surprise, of course. So uh, when I talk about microbes, that includes the ones that are making the insulin or something like that. Or the ones that are used to make things like Remicade or whatever. So um, these are some examples. Uh, Pseudomonas syringiae. I don't know much about this one, but apparently prevents ice crystals from forming in places where you wouldn't want ice forming um, for safety reasons, maybe. Uh, then we have Pseudomonas fluorescens that has bacillus thuringiensis genes to <laughs> destroy invading insects. Um, invading insects typically into crops is usually what this is used for. And then we can make plants more resistant by um, inserting the insecticide gene from that bacillus species into the plants themselves. So now we've got actual plants that are literally uh, having a gene from another organism, right? We already know that these things exist. We already know that there are GMOs. Um, whether it's the plants that are more resistant to uh, pests or, um, you know, are going to be hardier, they survive harsher conditions, or 
whatever it is. So um, we already know about that. But what's the what's the concern with it? Why should we be concerned about GMOs? Uh, with the plants themselves could share their genes for uh, being resistant to whatever it is with natural plants that could cause uh, super weed. So yeah, you might be growing this thing over here, but if it like gets out or their seeds get out or somebody takes it out to like, hey, I wanna grow my own of this, um, that could be spreading to other plants that did not ever have that introduced and now we're having a problem, right? Super weeds that we can't get rid of anywhere. Um, overgrowing, why is that a problem? Why is it important to be aware of the fact that like we didn't, don't need rando plants overgrowing things? Cause that can destroy our ecosystem. Plants that are not meant to be growing in certain locations now overgrowing in those locations can cause damage to our ecosystem. Uh, and that can lead to eventually lead to anyways, um, not having food, you know, talking about famine and stuff like that. Being completely serious here. All right. Um, uh, so scientists encounter that non genetically engineered plants and organisms swap genes all the time in unpredictable ways. Um, so you can have problems with this. Now, what do I mean by they are swapping genes all the time? Do I mean that a human being ate a GMO chicken and now they're getting the genes from the GMO chicken? No, that's absurd. I'm gonna tell you right now that it is. If you thought it wasn't, I'm telling you it is. So that's absurd. Um, yes, so what, the, what is the problem though? How are they changing genes, exchanging genes with one another? Uh, viruses typically is the problem. So yeah, that's a, that is a real concern or viruses that are infecting bacteria and the bacteria are you know, carrying the genes to other bacteria and then those bacteria infect something else. And that, these are stuff that we can't necessarily predict as um, you know, people nowadays. That's the problem with GMOs. You do not ever get GMO DNA from eating another GMO. No, that's not how it works. Do you get DNA from eating a non-GMO hamburger? The DNA is not specially different in the GMO organism. It's still just DNA in their system. So that's all I'm saying. Uh, and anyone telling otherwise is spreading misinformation. So, uh, but yeah, you can't just spread, the DNA doesn't jump over to other species like that. Otherwise it would have already. Um, but yeah, does that mean GMO? Am I saying that means GMO is good, all good? And no, there's problems, obviously. I'm not saying one way or the other. Uh, I will say GMO has saved farmers in America. There are so many farmers out there that would not be able to put food on the table for a lot of their families if it weren't for GMOs because of pesticide issues and all sorts of stuff. Um, so just, I mean, there's pluses and minuses. I encourage you guys, usually I have people do a debate over this in my classes. I stopped doing that, but um, I encourage you guys to actually look up legitimate resources on this stuff and educate yourselves about it because I feel like people um, could benefit from that sort of stuff. Should you be worried about GMO? Yes, but be educated on why is what I'm saying. Um, all right, gene therapy. So there's too many unknowns. I feel like that's the problem, right? That's a real issue, the unknowns. So gene therapy, this is using genes. Uh, you have a bad disease, you could die from it, and now trying to give you the right version of that gene, okay? That's ideal with gene therapy. You have, uh, your, maybe your daughter has a disease that like the other guy in his garage is trying to treat, but now they have adenovirus or retroviruses that we can put target genes into those guys to carry the genes into the person or their cells, and then um, you know infuse them with that basically, so that now they can have the gene. What does that make that person though? A GMO, just saying. Um, but yeah, so genetically modified viruses, we're going to put the normal, healthy working gene into somebody who otherwise can't do it. And we're probably, usually it's for people who would die otherwise. Cause this is risky, yes? Cause we're talking about like t changing somebody's genetics in their body actively. So this is risky, but if you're gonna die, then yeah, we might risk it. So this is the idea with ex vivo uh, gene therapy. You have the good gene, we clone it, we put it into whatever it is, let's say in this case, the viral genome, and we put it into the vector virus. It doesn't do anything else except for this. It does, isn't, it's not HIV anymore. It's not infectious for any other reason. We just use it as like a shell to get it to where we need it to go. 
if we take bones, bone marrow sample from somebody or some other sort of cell source, but typically it's gonna be bone marrow and infect it with that virus that we engineered. Now all of those cells have that as part of their genetics. And we can put that back into that person and fuse them back with their own bone marrow that has been genetically altered. Um, and then they will have expression of the normal gene. Is this a real thing? Is this something that we do in society? Is this something that can be done for people? Yes, it is. There are 13 different diseases that have been successfully approved for treatment by gene therapy so far. Spinal muscular atrophy, inherited vision loss, and acute uh, lymphoblastic anemia, I think is what it was originally. But, um, but yeah, those are just some examples of it. Again, so now we are uh, changing the DNA of the person. Now, if I take your bone marrow out of you and I put the virus in you with the new gene, and now you are, you know, new gene Sally or whatever, and uh, everything, are you going to be, if you have a baby after that point, are you going to be transmitting those genes on to your child, the fixed new genes? No, you're not. Okay. That is a somatic cell gene therapy. So it is permanent in that person, but it isn't going to be heritable in the future. Your gametes, they're already going to be made. They're already done. And that's in a whole other like different aspect of your body. It's harder to get that to change. You can, however, have germline therapy. If you had this horrible uh, heritable disease, maybe you went through somatic gene therapy. I don't know. Or maybe they don't have that available, but they do have germline therapy. Um, and you get pregnant. You could have your fetus, your eggs, your sperm, or whatever it is treated with germline therapy so that that can be heritable for that child's future. Okay, So that person, whenever your child is born, will have the normal gene and will be able to pass that normal gene on. So that is germline therapy. Of course, that's the goal, right? It's harder to target that because we're talking about the gametes. We're talking about eggs and sperm, early embryos. That's a whole other level of a problem. And also brings forward that whole concept of, yes, if we're treating the embryo, if you are having, because this is probably what would be, would be IVF situation, yeah. Um, if you're having IVF and this baby comes back with this, this problem, sure, it seems fine to go ahead and, and make these genetic changes for this baby, but at what point are you going to draw the line to say it's not eugenics? You know, when we get into that whole idea of, choosing the baby's eye color or changing their hair color or making them more likely to be athletic or what you guys see Gattaca. Yes. It's like Gattaca. That's what I'm worried about. Not me, but that's what you know, ethics is worried about. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So where is that? Okay. And not okay. And how do we compare? Like if we have people who are designer babies growing up versus the ones that were naturally born, how do you, that is the whole problem in Gattaca. If you haven't seen that movie, but it's got Ethan Hawke, guys, before he was, like, always playing, like, the bad guy character like he is now. Um, so this whole idea, what are some concerns with altering genetic code of a patient, even when changing a single known mutation? Even if all I was changing is that one mutation in that person, you still don't necessarily know how that might affect the other aspects of their genetics um, and stuff like that. And it's just there's so many unknowns. If there is a risk for a person dying, then yeah, right. Weighing the pros and cons gets pretty easy then. But if it is, we're talking about like, oh, well you have this genetic defect that makes you like be short or something like, yeah, you get it. 